my favorite partners in the travel um, industry and in Europe. And I'm looking forward to giving for, for them to give you their insight on what's been going on currently in Europe and their thoughts for the future and some of our favorite places across the pond. Um, I want to introduce you briefly to our panelists today. We have Sir Rocco Forte, chairman of Rocco Forte Hotels, who I've known personally for 17 years now. Um, I worked for Rocco Forte Hotels. That sounds dangerous. I know, I know. Uh, I worked for them um, through 2007. And um, you'll find Rocco Forte Hotels located through the UK, Europe, and uh, now in Shanghai. Uh, each not property- yet. Not yet. Oh, well, It'll coming be... in Shanghai. Yes. Coming I mean, soon. Uh, and in Russia, if Russia is not- yeah. Oh, wow. So um, one thing yeah. I love about Rocco Forte Hotels is each property reflects a spirit as unique as uh, their destination. And there's a warm, sophisticated sense of hospitality that's really the Forte family signature. And then we have Ori Hoffrey, who founded JK Place Hotels in 2003, starting with their beautiful and charming hotel in Florence. Um, then followed up by Capri and Rome, and now their first, um, their first hotel outside of Italy, JK Paris. Um, if you've ever stepped inside a JK hotel, you'll immediately recognize the touch of uh, Italian architect, uh, and I'm, I hope I pronounced this correctly, Michele Bonin. And uh, they are known as much for their unparalleled focus on the guest experience as they are for their style and design. And then we have uh, last but not least, of course, uh, one of my favorite special people, Jennifer Brasilio. And uh, we work with her and her team at Queen of Clubs very closely on the ground and now in the air uh, to create <laughs> unique and tailor-made experiences for you. Uh, they also help us procure very sought after tickets uh, to unique experiences and events. And we even work with them to procure villa hideaways. So thank you again, the three of you for taking time out of your evening to join us. And I'm gonna start to, with a couple of questions for the three of you um, as it pertains to what things have really been like uh, these past few months, as well as your thoughts and what inspires you, and then your hopes and thoughts for the future um, as it pertains to travel. So uh, maybe we'll start with you, Sir Rocco. I think you know people would really be interested in knowing from the three of you, um, where were you when the lockdown happened and um, how did it impact you and your loved ones? And what did you do to keep yourself mentally and physically healthy during those long months? So, Sir Rocco, we'll start with you. Well, I was in, I was in the UK. I moved to my place uh, in outside London. I have a farm. Uh, with all my family, actually, my uh, my three children, uh, their boy, girlfriend, fiance, and husband, my my um, my young grandson, who I saw walking actually for the first time during mm -hmm. during lockdown, um, and we so we sort of outside most of the time. The weather the weather was glorious in April and 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 right through. Uh, so from from a sort of comfort comfort. Uh, uh, situation it, it couldn't have been couldn't be, couldn't have been nicer. Obviously, um, uh, the underlying uh, worries that one had um, about the business and how 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 we would deal with the situation um, you know, made it quite made it uh, slightly less uh, enjoyable than it could have been. Um, but so I was you know I was luckier than most, and I sort of dread to think for people who had to. Uh, stay locked indoors in a small apartment with screaming children uh, and so on. It must have been a nightmare for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, Jennifer, what about you? I know um, in Rome and in Italy in general, um, it, was a, it was a really, you know, severe situation and then there was a real boom, hard lockdown. 
Yes. Um, I was actually just before the lockdown happened, I was in London and Paris in complete denial that this was even going to happen. And I arrived back on the Wednesday night from London to Rome and the schools all shut down that day. For the, so starting the next day, there was no more school. And my daughter's eight years old. So we have an apartment in Rome. We have a, you know little balconies, but not a lot of outdoor space. We were very fortunate though, during the lockdown, we found out we had a roof terrace that had this gorgeous view of the Vatican. So we use that often. Um, but, you know, actually the first month we, um, I had a very busy March plan. So I was really um, enjoying the family time. I think for most people, at least for us, for sure. Uh, it was the most amount of time that we've ever spent locked away with our families and our lives. So we, um, we took advantage, you know, we were, we were allowed out once a week to go to, or as minimal as possible to go to the supermarket or the, the butcher or the pharmacy. And we always had to have a, um, a, a sheet of paper that declared where we were going and our passports as well. And if you were stopped, you know, they would, they were monitoring everybody and they were stopping and asking a lot of questions. Uh, but we ate well, we drank well, and um, I exercised a lot over WhatsApp video <laughs> with, <laughs> with a trainer or through Zoom. So I um, made the best of it. And I have to say, I think the Italians did an amazing job overall in, um, in, with everything that they did in terms of the lockdown and um, you know, making sure that we were all safe. And Ori, um, you and I spoke a few weeks ago, so I know a little bit about where, where you were and what you were doing, but um, I'm sure our clients would like to know your, your saga as well. Uh, well, Italy was one of the very first country to do the lockdown uh, after China was definitely the first one in Europe to really close everything down and Italian respectfully extremely well. Uh, but very frankly speaking, we were quite afraid of what was going uh, to happen. And uh, I took advantage of my wife being a, a Uruguayan. So we flew out of Italy to South America and we spent, uh, uh, I have to say, uh, three beautiful months in Montevideo in Uruguay, uh, where actually it was, uh, here it was uh, still winter and over there was at the end of the summer. So the weather was uh, quite nice and we had a really... Uh, an amazing opportunity to spend a three beautiful month with the family, with the kids. I have three little babies, years three, five, and uh, and seven. So it was really quite unique to spend uh, all this time together. And uh, Uruguay, which is a very small country, uh, they were really afraid of the COVID. And actually what they did, they really, um, they closed down the airport. They closed the borders with uh, Brazil and Argentina. And... Uh, up today, uh, in five months, they had 1,800 cases of uh, COVID. So actually very limited number of people compared to their you know, next door countries. So they also respect very well the, uh, what the government was suggesting people to, to follow you know, uh, all the new, the new normal, the, the mask and the social distance and this and that. And people, yeah, so, we were in Uruguay and it was really nice. And then actually I was also very happy to be back. And of course, we were also very much frustrated about this uh, unique scenario that we are still living um, today, which is really uh, somehow unreal uh, to, to live in such a completely different uh, world from what we left uh, in March when we left to Uruguay, coming back and now a few months after it's completely different uh, world. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I know it's just, I think if somebody would have told us, I, I remember my husband and I, we went out for, for dinner on, I don't know, May 10th, or, or excuse me, March 10th or March 13th. And we kind of knew that there was a big shutdown coming, right? But we thought, oh, you know, it's going to last two, two weeks, maybe towards the end of my, the month, my brother owns a restaurant. And to think that we're still kind of in this same scenario is really, I think sometimes, you know, hard to, hard to believe. And uh, I know personally, I feel very blessed because we have wonderful outdoor space and, you know, I have a big backyard and I can do gardening or I can go on walks and things like that. So I, 
and you know we don't have small children at home anymore so i don't have to do the home you know the homeschooling and everything like that i feel so you know my heart goes out for people who don't have access to outdoor space and are trying to work and you know help their children with schooling and things like that and then you really realize how much being able to actually get away and travel is so mentally rejuvenating so yeah um so come, speaking of that we know now that europe is you know slowly opening their borders to intra-europe um travel uh americans of course aren't allowed to to travel yet to europe what do you feel are some of the most important things for our clients know to know about as it pertains to the current state uh of travel within the countries where you all operate. Um, have you had a chance to travel around at all in, you know, from country to country um, personally over the past few months? And what is the vibe like in general? You know, how are the everyday average citizens going about their lives? Um, maybe, maybe Jennifer, maybe you want to start off with this one. Sure, absolutely. Yes, we've we traveled. We took advantage of these moments, so we traveled around a lot the last few months um, throughout France, south of France, um, Italy, throughout Italy a lot, and also to Spain to Ibiza. And um, right now, the current state of Rome is it's very positive. It's you know our lives have, are are moving as normal. Um, restaurants are open. We don't have. Um, we don't have the restrictions that you all have in the U.S., I would say, in terms of, you know, it has to be 25% capacity or else, you know, you can't eat inside. You know, I keep hearing that in the U.S. It's not like that at all. I mean, for, you know, granted, we have um, beautiful weather right now um, and a lot of people are choosing to eat outside in France and in, in Italy. But um, even so, we've eaten indoors too. And this, the tables are spaced out a little bit more, of course, and there are new restrictions in place and they take your temperature with um, the little temperature gun. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, some, some restaurants will ask for your name and your phone number and your email to make sure that um, if something does happen, they have, they have all the names of the people that were eating there on that occasion. My daughter's back in school and there are new rules and ways of going to school, but it's working and she's been there since the 7th or 8th of September now. So um, life is going on as, as, as it was before, but we wear masks, we're much more careful, we're not hugging and kissing, um, you know, but, but we're using our sanitizer, we're washing our hands more often. Uh, social distancing, but it's, but it's working. It's okay. Um, I know in France, I was, you know, my team is, is moving around the Metro people are working uh, in offices. They're going to work there. The terraces are, are busy and people are out They're wearing their masks. Um, UK is a bit slower, I would say, but I mean, Sir Rocco, I think you're in the UK. So you, maybe you could speak on that a little bit better than me, but um, I know my team that lives in London, they're moving around, but they say it's, you know, a little bit emptier. It's a lot emptier than usual. But, um, but I would say for me personally, um, it's a bit more life as usual, but without a lot more people around. So Rocco, um, maybe you can talk a little bit about what it is like in, in London, but also tell us a little bit about what it's like in uh, what are your teams experiencing in, in Brussels and in Germany, some of the other um, places? Yeah, well, the, the, um, uh, the, the situation generally in Europe is that there are travel corridors between different countries. Uh, so Italy is open to a number of different countries. The UK is open to Italy uh, and, and, and Germany. Um, uh, but close to a lot of, to France, to, to uh, um, Spain and Portugal uh, at, at, at the moment. The, the, um, we're, here in this, uh, we're here in the UK, uh, you know, uh, the government is sort of paranoid, become paranoid and started uh, being captive of its own propaganda. And we're sort of looking at another uh, possible new, new lockdown, the new restrictions being brought in, uh, restaurants have been 
told to, and bars have been told to close at 10 o'clock at night. So that means everybody uh, uh, goes out into the street and mingles at the same time. So it's not very, not very clever. There's not a lot of logic to what has, what has been going, going on. The, there's, there's a lot of talk of a second wave. I mean, the reality is that there are some localized spikes uh, in, in infection. But, uh, but no one is, uh, uh, very few people are being hospitalized or, 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 uh, or are dying. I'm very skeptical about the whole thing. And I think governments have generally overreacted across, across Europe. I had the disease myself right at the beginning of lockdown. And I was sort of three weeks, I wasn't very well. But after that, I've, uh, I've, uh, I've recovered. And uh, the reality of this disease it is, is affects uh, a relatively small group of people, people who are old with underlying health problems. Most other people aren't in any danger or risk at all from the disease. Your chances of dying from COVID, if you're a healthy uh, person under, under 60, uh, as, as much as being stung by a bumblebee if you're, if you're outside. So, so I think the whole thing has been uh, uh, very exaggerated. It's devastated our industry in a way uh, worse than many than many others, and there's no sign of any any real recovery or possibility of recovery mm -hmm. until uh, things start normalizing again. Um, the the um, uh, uh, I'm, I got back into my office in uh, uh, the middle of July, uh, and uh, I started bringing some of my people back, the senior people, so that we could work together and plan uh, uh, you know the way ahead. Uh, we officially opened our offices on the 1st of September. Many offices haven't, uh, haven't reopened yet uh, or on uh, uh, very reduced levels of, of staff. Um, and the situation is still, is still pretty grim. May Mayfair is empty. Um, restaurants are sort of half full. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's rather depressing. In Italy, on the other hand, I've found... Uh, things are much more normal. Of course, if you, you've got to remember in Italy that the disease was localized uh, to the Lombardy region um, and sort of from Florence downwards, there was very little disease at all. And probably there, it was completely exaggerated to close the whole, the whole country, country down. Uh, and funny enough, in, in, uh, in Italy, there no, we're not seeing any spikes uh, in infections which we're seeing in, in Spain, uh, France, and to some degree in Germany. Or Germ although Germany seems to have been the lightest hit uh, by, the, uh, by the disease. Um, and Belgium too has had, well, Belgium actually has had the highest number of deaths per, per, per million of population uh, in Europe, and is one of the highest in, in the world. And no one really understands the, the reason for this. So, uh, in Italy, the funny thing is people are wearing masks. You go into an office, you're expected to wear a mask. You go into the meeting room and people come in and shake hands with you. So it's rather a contradiction in terms. <laughs> Getting onto planes, you know, I, I've flown to Italy quite a lot in the last, in the last month. Uh, you, you social distance, uh, queuing to get into the plane. They board by, uh, by seat rows. Uh, and then, uh, and then, and then you're all sitting uh, three, six to a row, cheek by jowl. So what? You know, there's no real point in the social distancing beforehand. Right. Uh, it's, it's. But I was at Verdura, uh, my resort in in uh, in the south of Sicily, uh, in August, and actually that uh, we were at about uh, we, are pro we made a profit there, at sort of two thirds of last year's level, which I think was quite an achievement in the circumstances. And it was almost like a normal. You saw the staff wore masks. Uh, but apart from that, things were, were you know, so you thought, ah, at last, sanity at last. And of course, then you get back to London and things are, are, still, are still grim. So I don't know, it's, it's uh, things are opening up. Uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully, um, uh, hopefully the you know restrictions will ease and and there won't be too much panic about these uh, these infections but are rising and we'll right. start getting back to normality again.
But the reality <laughs> for my sort of business is that it depends on international travel. Until that returns to a reasonable level, it's always going to be very difficult for us. Mm -hmm. Well, and that kind of brings me to my next question. So I know for, for, for both Ori and for you, Sir Rocco, I mean, and, and I know coming, you know, from the hotel side myself, you know, as hoteliers, you spend years and months planning and the planning and the design and the construction and the operational buildup when you're opening a new hotel. I mean, Ori, just this, you know, this time last year, you were getting ready to, you know, open up JK Paris and you were doing your soft opening. And then in spring, you were planning your grand opening. And then uh, for Sir Rocco in May, uh, last year, you were opening up uh, Hotel de, de la Ville and Rocco Forte House in Rome and Tori Demiza and Puglia. And then this year, you were getting ready to open up a new property in Sicily, uh, Villa Egea. And then boom, coronavirus happens. You know, nobody plans for something like this. And so it must have been very devastating on many levels, especially for your teams who work so incredibly hard um, on these projects, as well as for, for you on both a personal level and a professional level. Can the two of you tell us, you know, number one, were you able to keep your staff um, on during the lockdown? And what special steps have you had to undertake in order to prepare to reopen your properties and how has this impacted any new projects? Um, maybe Ori, you'll, you can start and then Sir Rocco, you can pick up afterwards. Um, uh, of course, uh, our hotels, uh, they are, as you said before, uh, all hotels are beautifully designed, uh, attractive, uh, beautiful boxes, but the soul of the hotel are the people that are working in it and with their passion, with their love, with their heart, that they bring uh, uh, hospitality through their humanity. And uh, for example, in Perry, the one you just mentioned, uh, we just opened the hotel. The city was in a lockdown and uh, Ricardo, our general manager, decided to move into the hotel and he spent his lockdown uh, three months inside the hotel. He didn't want to leave uh, his baby in Paris uh, alone during this time. So definitely we also try to attract, to have people who work with us who are uh, really uh, in love with uh, what, we, what we do. And it's uh, reciprocal. I mean, we uh, now we the hotel reopened. Now we have a few guests, and I think we have to be blessed. Uh, even if we have uh, one guest in the in, in the hotel, and we have to do uh, to bring out the best of our efforts to take this opportunity to really uh, finally be back at work and finally uh, enjoy this very special moment. Be able to engage a relationship to host them, to show them uh, our city, to show them uh, um, all our, uh, sorry, love and passion about uh, what, what we are doing. And by exchanging this uh, relationship um, between us and the guests, uh, uh, that's, I think, it's the pure um, you know, energy and, and the fuel that we give to our engine to continue working. Uh, uh, so now it's really a, a unique opportunity. We have a, a few guests and we can really look after them in the best, uh, uh, in the best way because we are not, uh, you know, it's fashion week this week in Paris. It should be packed and crazy and parties and events. It's very quiet. Uh, it's busy, but quiet. Uh, so it's really the perfect opportunity to, to look after each guest we have in the hotel um, in the best way. Uh, uh, you know, um, so for some reason, we, we, we expect uh, hotels in low season, not actually, we expect the hotel to have a low season or shoulder season and high season. Um, in, in my mind, you know, low season should be the high season because if there is less guests, I can probably give a better service. Uh, sometimes it's uh, not realistic and you cannot do it, but uh, um, I usually compare our way to do hotels to when you want to buy a suit. So a man can walk or a woman to a store and go to uh, Armani and Prada and Gucci, all these beautiful brands. But then at some point he want to walk in the Seville Row and uh, 
create uh, his maiden major suit with a, and uh, in that case he needs to uh, to start to engage a relationship with the tailor and uh, it will not be uh, 10 minutes to walk into a store to, to sweep by your credit card and to buy your suit you have to create a relationship um, um, and uh, the tailor will not give you discount uh, three for two or two for three uh, in, uh, in season in, in for sale and like him also other brands uh, Chanel doesn't do discount Hermes I never saw a sign outside for discount and if you want to buy a Patek Philippe you have to wait uh, three years if you're lucky and if they will ever sell it to you so why should an hotel on the other hand uh, uh, discount or give a drop the rate or change completely his policy if the product and the services we are offering to the to, to the guests is actually even better now than what it would be tremendous in, in a very peak peak season uh, so the opportunity is, is there to really welcome each uh, guest into the hotel and try to do the best we can uh, we had the last week uh, uh, someone from uh, the embassy of Qatar uh, walking by our hotel to see our property in Paris. Uh, he asked if he can have a coffee, uh, of course. And then we asked for the bill. Uh, we offer him the coffee. I say, why did you offer me the coffee? I say, well, you spent your time, uh, very precious time to come and see our hotel just out of curiosity because you wanted to visit it. And uh, the little gesture we can do uh, as Italian in Paris is to offer you a cup of coffee. Well, today he came back for lunch, he bring his people, bringing guests, maybe we'll book some rooms. Uh, uh, that's the opportunity, you know, in, in a time where the hotel would be super busy, uh, packed with people, uh, maybe the coffee, we will not be able to, to talk to, the, to this person, to entertain a relationship and, uh, and to start from this, uh, you know, a next uh, uh, chapter. Yeah, yeah I, I wish so much that, even personally myself, this would be such an amazing time to visit Europe because without as many people, I personally think the best time to come is fall, winter, spring, because there isn't all the competition for the attention. And, and you really get to have that one-on-one -on -one interaction with local people, with the staff and things like that. And so now I, you know, if I could jump on a plane and, and be there, I would, I would be there in a heart, in a heartbeat just to, to have this unique uh, experience. So, um, so Sirocco, what, what about you? I mean, you know, were you able to, to keep all your staff over these, these months and how have you been able to, to, you know, reopen, slowly reopen again? Yeah, well, in, uh, in Europe, we've had uh, uh, government schemes, which uh, we call it furlough in the UK, which is in, used in the UK, specifically for this. But, but in Italy, you have Cassa Integrazione. In Germany, they have a system uh, where if you lay off staff for, for a, um, a limited period of time, uh, the government will cover a large proportion of the, the wages up to a certain certain level. Uh, so we were able to, to utilize these schemes uh, uh, with all our hotels uh, in Europe. And so whilst the hotels were closed, um, staff still had an income uh, uh, to, uh, and, and, money, and money to live on. In many cases, we would, because there's a ceiling on what governments pay, in many cases, we topped up people who were, who were uh, earning above the ceiling uh, generally to about 70% of their, of, their, of, their, of their salary. Um, and, um, and of course, we still have a lot of staff still not, not working, even where we've uh, reopened the hotels, because, because uh, uh, there's obviously not the business to justify a full team of staff. Um, uh, in the UK, unfortunately, the government scheme is coming to an end. In October, and and we've had to take the decision to make a number of our staff redundant. About 80 staff in the UK out of a total number of 450 uh, we we employ. In in continental Europe, the scheme has been continued at least till the end of December, so it would be not necessary to take such drastic action. 
and this has been my main worry, is being able to look after the staff uh, and ensure um, that we kept the good, the good people. As Ori said, you know, our business depends uh, not just on the beautiful building, but also uh, the, the service that we give, and that depends entirely uh, on the enthusiasm and passion of the staff that we, in, that, that we employ. So you want to keep your teams together as much as possible. Obviously, with, with, this, with this crisis, everybody, as you said at the beginning, thought it was going to be four or five weeks. And of course, it's extended into months and will probably be a year before we even uh, see the beginnings of, uh, of, of coming out of it. Um, and for, for my, you know, my business is seeing, uh, uh, during the closure, we're seeing five million, uh, five million pounds a month going out of the window. Um, and we're still, we're still, uh, we're st although all our hotels are open now, occupancy is very low, and uh, uh, we're losing little, little less. Uh, but uh, we still have money going out of the window. And so my preoccupation was was mostly to say, how do we keep alive? How do we stay alive? Because uh, you know, I've got had an, an element of resources available. Uh, to me, you know, we had uh, cash in the bank and we had lines of credit, but they're not going to be enough. So I've had to go out and borrow and borrow more money, uh, partially through uh, through um, in Italy through the government scheme there, which allows you to borrow to borrow money. Um, and so I'm going to end up uh, uh, with more indebtedness than I had at the at the beginning. Uh, but it looks as though we'd be able to keep our business together and most of the key people uh, uh, who are important to the business um, um, close close to us. Everybody has taken a reduction in salary of 20% during this period who continue to work uh, and uh, you know are happy to do so until things things get uh, a little back to normal again. So it's not, a, it's, you know, I can't say, I mean, I like the idea of the opportunity of talking to customers more, but I'd rather have a full hotel than, than, than be able to talk to customers more. Yes. <laughs> I'm still yes. trying to talk we, to the we customers. We all would like business rushing yeah. back again. That is, that is for sure. I think but your, your hotel in Capri did, or, did all right during the summer, didn't it? Um, well, yes. Um, compared to last August, was down um, only twenty percent. August compared yes. to last August, uh, it was a very strange uh, summer because uh, we reopened the hotel. It was uh, the eighteenth of June, and uh, we start to organize the reopening in May, and it was in the middle of a lockdown, and we were completely somehow uh, crazy. Why? How come are we going to open an hotel? this summer it's like it, it at that point it seems like impossible or something completely crazy in fact we were one of the first in, i mean I think, the, I think the first in capri and in, in the amalfi coast and then it was completely like normal that we would be open like it would, wouldn't make any sense not to open um but this is our last uh, week we are closing on sunday uh, compared to normal season that usually goes um, until the end of October because uh, there is no people now coming. I think summer was very special in Europe, uh, especially in Italy, because people, they were coming out from the lockdown and everybody knows that this winter will be very challenging and most probably we're, we're going back home. <laughs> so let's enjoy the summer. Uh, otherwise, we need to wait another 12 months before I see the sun and the sea again. So let's july and august let's go to the beach and then and then we'll see what will happen next yeah right yeah in fact we had a lot more italian customers than we normally do in our in in our two resorts in in puglia and uh, and in sicily one thing that's important about italy is that um countries uh, that where where there's a quarantine imposed by italy if you come in from you can you can take a test and get around that. I think you take a test five days before you leave uh, the country you're, uh, you're traveling from. And if, if, it's, if it's negative, uh, then you can, you can travel to the country and you take a test when you arrive. And if that's negative again, then you're allowed to, uh, you're don't, you don't have to quarantine when you're in, you're in the country. 
So Why people not? who ne really yeah. need, need, need to go to Italy, for example, can go there, even from the United States. I'm hoping that those kind of, those kind of philosophies, those type of programs are what happens, you know, six months from now, nine months from now, and we can, you know, if America can control their counts, that these are the things that can happen. You know, right now, many of the Caribbean islands, we can, are opening up to us and we can have a test 72 hours prior to arrival, we can go. Maybe if we're staying for a week, we have to have another test, you know, five days in or seven days in, something like that. But I know, Jennifer, you mentioned when we were talking on the phone about your experience when you went to um, Forte Thank Village, you. was that correct? Oh, Forte Village, yes, yes. We went um, at the end of August and that was when Sardinia was really, um, rocking because all the nightclubs are open. So a lot of people started coming down with the virus and then going back home to the mainland of Italy. So at one point, um, for us, for us, well, when you entered Forte Village, they were fantastic because they did the finger blood test on each and every guest that entered the property. And then, and they had a contained, their, their lobby was now a contained um, area that after you tested, they had this, they invested in machines and laboratory and doctors on site. And um, if you had a negative uh, blood test, then you were free to go and enter the resort and you were on vacation without having to wear a mask or worry because everybody that entered the property, staff included, were all tested. If you left the resort at any time, you'd have to retest to come back. Um, and if you tested with a positive result on the finger test, they um, quarantined you into one of their hotels that wasn't open. Um, and you, they did the tampone, the um, nose test. And then uh, within hours, you would know if you were positive or negative. And they said that they had a lot of false positives on the finger test, but on the nose test, everybody ended up being negative. So it was a very uh, normal holiday, very normal vacation. Um, for five days we were there and when I went to the car to go back to the airport, I totally forgot about masks and everything and I was like, oh my God, my mask. So um, it, was, it was wonderful. But at, while we were there, we had um, heard from my daughter's school that she needed to have the um, tampone done to go back to school because we had gone to Sardinia after the 23rd of August. So we both had it done and we did it at five o'clock at night on property. And by the time we returned from dinner, we had the results. So that was a really, it was just an overall great experience. We can't get testing like that here. It's just mind boggling. No. But, but I just had to have another test done in Rome and it was a bit more complicated. Yeah. Um, no, that's really interesting. So Jennifer, you know, as a business operator, I'm sure you and Filippo, you spend a great deal of time each year, you know, putting together your business plan, your forecast. Um, you probably are always brainstorming to come up with new ideas and projects. And then also, you know, something like this happens, coronavirus. And you're operating in four different countries, Spain, the UK, France, Italy. You have an office in Switzerland. That must have posed so many unique challenges. Can you tell us a little bit about how you've had to pivot over these past months and maybe, you know, new ways of doing business and new projects um, as well? We're learning a lot as we go, don't we? <laughs> We're really learning international law, everything. It's been, it's been challenging and, and fun. Um, but in terms of new, we're looking toward the future. We made a lot of decisions very early on that we were, we were going to survive this. And we started doing our budget zeroed out all the way through to 2021. And we said, we're going to survive this. We're, we're going to come through this. So we're looking ahead. We, um, we, we were already a private jet broker. We did that in early 2019. That was a new division that we had, um, you know, really invested in. And we decided to really push that part of our business a bit more because we were seeing that become more and more popular. Um, we're looking, um, we're, we're doing a lot behind the scenes right now, innovating, 
um, technology, working with Axis and UMAP and things like that, um, trying to keep our staff motivated, looking toward the future. And we're also looking at new destinations that we're um, opening. So we're enhancing our current destinations and looking at um, two new ones. Yeah, so that brings me to a question I love to pose to all three of you. So if you were, you know, Jennifer, if you were going to expand Queen of Clubs footprint, you know, a couple of years ago, you expanded and opened an office in Ibiza. What would be like your number one, like, place you'd say, oh, this is a perfect Queen of Clubs spot? That's a good so where we're going to expand is maybe not where I, we probably should expand because a lot of people are asking us to go to Greece, go to yeah. Croatia, because it fits with the whole mold of Ibiza, Saint-Tropez, London and Paris, you know, more of that like experience, um, going out type of, um, you know, destination. So a lot of people are asking us to do that. Um, it's, it's on our radar, of course, we would love to, but it's not something that we're looking at right now. What we're looking at now is actually, um, and we've been doing, and how we've always opened our, our new offices and destinations has been by um, doing it on a bespoke, tailor-made basis, request only, to get our feet wet, to get entrenched in the destination. So this summer we had um, one of our directors go to his home country of Switzerland because we have our office in Switzerland. And um, we're right now curating um, experiences, meeting with locals and hoteliers and working toward um, Switzerland as another destination for us because it's a great combination with Italy as well. And the Netherlands is another one that's um, a great, um, we, get, we get a lot of requests for the Netherlands and we've always turned it down. So last year we started, you know, very small doing some things there and um, we're pushing toward that as well because it's a great pairing with London, Paris and even Italy. A lot of people combine Amsterdam for a few days. So um, that's, that's our outlook. Right. So Ori, I know that you and I spoke about this a little bit in our conversation. Um, I know we're, we're dreamers. I think that entrepreneurial people, we're always thinking about, you know, what we'd love to do in the future. So if you could open a hotel somewhere in the world, anywhere, where would anywhere. that be? Um, mm -hmm. I would be in, a, in, in, definitely in Malibu. Malibu. I, see my, I see myself in Malibu. I'm a California dreamer. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> I would go to a JK uh, Malibu. Yeah, me too. Me too. I, I can't <laughs> wait. Um, it, it's good to have some some dream because we have to always uh, uh, dream. Uh, I don't know if this will ever happen. Definitely, we are uh, trying to to expand and to bring uh, uh, more of our hotels in uh, in Italy, which is definitely uh, an area that we that we know uh, better and. Uh, we have few opportunities here and in Europe, uh, but my dream is definitely one day to move to uh, to the States and to try to open and to bring our concept also on the other side of the of the ocean. Uh, and California definitely is a uh, is a state that I really um, like and enjoy, and I love uh, spending time there. Uh, actually, love the people, uh, everything. So one day. <laughs> and uh, Sirocco. I know Hello. you're always dreaming of new places to to um, open properties, and recently you just uh, announced Mil Milano, so that's exciting. Yes, we're, 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 so I'm not as romantic as uh, as as Ori and May. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 you know, we have, I have a lot of a lot, quite a lot of targeted destinations. I like to be in New York, which I've been saying for a long time. Yes, I've yeah. yet to find the the, the suitable. But, but, you know, Paris, uh, Madrid, Moscow are all, are all cities. But I think the important thing is that in Italy, we, we're already well established. And uh, really, Jair will open in May of, uh, of May of next year. And the work there has continued uh, during COVID because uh, apart from a, a month or so, um, uh, construction sites continue, could continue to work. Uh, so we'll open that hotel, I think, which is going to be an amazing, an amazing property. Actually, it is an amazing property, but 
government will bring it back to its, uh, the glory of its past. Uh, and Palermo is a very interesting city. The, the, um, you know, we're looking uh, to develop, a, 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 you, know, a, you mentioned Milan, which won't open for two years because it's got to close first at the end of this year and then, and then be restructured before we reopen it. It's the Baglioni uh, in Milan on Via del Senato and Via della Spiga, which is very, very well located. And then uh, Venice uh, is something, obviously a, a city I should be in, uh, but I like, I want to be on the Melfi coast. I want to be in a lot of the cultural uh, cities with, with smaller hotels. So I'm focusing very much on, on Italy uh, um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a destination and trying to create uh, uh, the luxury group in Italy where you can come to Italy and just and go everywhere and stay with me. So, so that is uh, <laughs> the, the you can do the grand tour of the Rock of Forty Hotels. That that's that, that's the idea. Um, we're we're discussing we're in we're quite advanced stage of discussion with Rock of Forty Houses in Florence and Milan and London actually. Uh, uh, so so we've got quite a uh, and we're and we're discussing a pretty advanced stage in Athens and Mykonos. Uh, with, with projects, with projects there, so we have quite an expansion pipeline now. Um, my son is very much involved in, in, in that, and with his colleague. Uh, what? Being twelve years old, Sirocco, your son. <laughs> yeah, well, he's now he's now twenty nine. So, oh my gosh! <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's. Uh, 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 and uh, no, he's uh, he's doing very well. So we we've got quite a quite a program ahead of us over the next few years, uh, assuming that everything gets back to normal quite quickly. Yeah, it it will. Um, so I think that you know, and you bring up a very good point with like the Rocco Forte houses, and 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 I also think you know. You, even with the JK places and the and the and the style of Rocco Forte being small and boutique, how do you, the three of you, see envision, you know, travel changing in the future? I mean, I kind of have my thoughts and ideas on that, but I'd love to hear from from the three of you, because I do think the one thing that maybe coronavirus has shown us, and, and I'm talking about Americans, not so much Europeans, is that it's possible to slow down. You know, it is possible to, to work remotely, to not try to do everything in 10 days or one week. And for American, the American traveler, my hope is that when international borders reopen and we're able to travel again, is that people will take a different approach to travel and stay longer and dive deeper and maybe not try to do so much in a short period of time. Um, we had to postpone so many trips for the summer 2020, you know, and 99% of those were to Europe. And, you know, we, our clients were so gracious and allowed us to hold those deposits and say, you know, we want to go, we'll wait to go in 2021. And so we're hoping it, our hope is that when we start to plan those journeys again, that they'll be in a slightly different way but I'd be interested in hearing the three of your thoughts on that and what you kind of envision the future of travel. Um, you Maybe ask me? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, um, my feeling now is that people uh, uh, will take, uh, mm, you cannot really think plan too much in advance anymore because you don't know what will happen the, uh, tomorrow. So I think in the beginning, it will be a sort of a revenge uh, in terms of, uh, oh, you know, freedom have been taken away from, uh, from people. And uh, once uh, you're not free anymore, uh, 
and you feel like you're in jail, in prison, you cannot move, you cannot do that, you cannot go out dinner, you cannot travel, you cannot, you cannot do anything. Now that at some point this, uh, you will get back your freedom, then you can, you can start uh, again to, to, to live and to experience and to travel. Uh, and I think that, you know, maybe uh, people were to say, oh, uh, next year I'm turning uh, 60, 40, 50, and I want to play, I want to plan uh, this, uh, tr this safari. Oh, in two years time, I want to do this because it's going to be my uh, granddaughter, 18th birthday. You, I don't, I think people will say, oh, mm, can I go this weekend uh, to uh, uh, Italy? Can I travel uh, next week uh, to, um, to the Caribbean? Can I, people, I think, will tend to do things now instead of later because uh, as there is a famous advertising commercial on TV, say life is now. So you have, we have to, to enjoy the moment, to take advantage of what you can really uh, afford, what you can really do now, because eventually then you will regret that you didn't do it. So I think in the very first uh, time that people would be able to go back to, to travel, um, my personal feeling that people will travel as much as they can, and they will not plan too much in advance for the future. They will do it. Uh, Be more uh, spontaneous. Yeah, more spontaneous, yes. Which is actually something that happened also this summer. I, I saw it in Italy that people were not planning anything. They were just uh, driving with their cars from Europe, going to Italy, uh, discovering Italy, and then deciding uh, where to go to sleep, uh, where to stay, what to visit. Uh, um, you know, we used to say last minute, that was a very last second booking for uh, all of us. Mm -hmm. And people were deciding really, which actually give a lot of, an, it, it's, a, it's also very nice as a traveler when you, when you don't need to plan too much in advance, you just do things that you feel like doing on, on, on the spot, on the same, on, on the, that moment. Right. But, yeah. So Rocco, what about you? What are your thoughts for tra for travel in the future? Do you see, do you feel any different trends? Well, I mean, uh, certainly in the short term, uh, everything will be, uh, you know, it is very, they're very, I mean, we're, the bookings we're getting now, we're getting during the summer, a very short term, uh, very little in advance, even though from one week to the, to, to the next. I think we're in a situation where some people are very relaxed about this disease and are carrying on their, their normal lives as, uh, uh, as, as before, and others are, very, are still very scared. And I think many people won't travel, uh, get to traveling again until there's a vaccine. And certainly, polls in the United States have shown have shown that. Um, I mean, I saw a poll that was in, uh, uh, carried out in August to people who travel who travel regularly, and 40% said they wouldn't travel to Europe until there was a vaccine, and 60% said they wouldn't travel to the Far East until there was a vaccine. Mm. So, so I think there's you know there's the uh, the overhang of this of this current crisis will will continue for. Uh, for a while. But I'm, you know, when we had the financial crisis, everything was going to change, nothing would be the same again. You know, there have been several crises I've been through in my life where, where mm -hmm. you know, and then eventually things get back to normal. Memories are short and, and people, even, even this working from home has its, has its limitations. In certain, uh, you know, in certain jobs you can work from home. I mean, I found that the first month of working from home during lockdown was very productive, but I was working with a small group of people who knew each other very well, and it was possible, it was possible to do that uh, efficiently. But as we went on, I found myself getting more lackadaisical, and you know, I'm a pretty motivated person. I thought, if it's happening to me, it's going to happen to, to many in my, of my employees. And I think, uh, you know, we forget um, yeah, the importance of interaction and uh, spontaneity, uh, and you don't create a culture uh, in a business uh, by people working for, with people working remotely. So there's got to be a strong element of getting uh, people grouping them, grouping together again and working together uh, in, a, in a more normal way. I think we might see people, uh, uh, people, you know, taking maybe a day or two during the week when they work from home they'll still have to be going to the offices. Uh, with travel, I don't know about, uh, I don't know enough about the American psyche, but American holidays are short. 
so I don't know, but I think there are plenty of Americans who are retired uh, or semi-retired uh, who have no trouble taking long holidays today. So, so uh, I'm spending quite a lot of time. Some come to Europe for the whole summer. Uh, so, so, uh, so I, I, you're in a better position to answer that than than me. Jennifer, what it, what have you been doing over the past few months? And I, are you seeing, you know, an uptick in like longer stay bookings and things like that? I am actually, I am. This summer we had one client who has been here in Europe traveling around uh, since July, moving around. He even went to French Polynesia and came back and he's been working all, around, all, all along the way. So last week he was in a villa that we rented for him in Tuscany and he needed a scanner and a printer um, at the villa. So that was an important element because he was working. Um, we're seeing for next year that people that are, that are wanting to plan, they're mostly asking for, I mean, we're getting a lot more requests for, you know, six weeks trips where in the past it was never like that. Um, you know, even two or three week trips, the trips are much longer, we're noticing. Um, and a lot of people are asking uh, for apartments and villas, hotels, of course, too, but apartments and villas are a big ask right now. Um, but people don't want to put the deposits down, of course, because they're afraid of, you know, the cancellation policies and not getting the money back. So, you know, we're, we're doing our best to, you know, to help people get what they want, but at the same time to not uh, lose as much money as, you know, because they might have lost in the past. Um, also, private experiences are very popular right now. If people want to travel, they don't want to be with the masses. They want to know, you know, can I go out at hours? Can I, do I have to wait in a line? Am I going to be, you know, in a group? Um, so they're not doing it right now, but I mean, we barely sold any experiences this year, which is normally our biggest seller. But I know for the future, people are very curious and questioning about that. And then got, um, greeters at the airports, at the train stations, having their hand held is very important. Private cars, um, not really taking the trains or, or sitting maybe in a smaller, you know, you know, cabin or, you know, coach on the train instead. And then the private jets, of course, you know, we had a client who was afraid to get on a, on a commercial flight and she flew JFK to Ireland round trip to avoid flying commercial. So, um, we, we are seeing, I, I totally agree with Ori about um, the last minute element because I think people really don't know. But I'm seeing now and hearing now a lot of people that are working from home, smart working is becoming more and more the norm. Um, hearing about offices in New York that are just not opening up again until next year. Same in London, people are just not going back to the offices. Um, so people are smart working. We had, we had an Italian family in my daughter's class who um, as soon as the lockdown happened, they went to Cortina and now they're staying there for the whole year because she's able to smart work. So they've enrolled the children in an Italian school for the year and they'll come back to Rome next year. So um, there's definitely this reality of, oh, if the kids don't have to go to school and they're already online learning, why don't we go and rent a house here and do this? And so it's definitely happening in Europe and in the US, I think too. Yeah, we're definitely seeing that trend, you know, oh, my kids are online learning, I might as well go rent a villa somewhere for three months and, and we're all working remotely anyway. So let's just, let's do that. So that is definitely a trend. So we do have a, a few questions um, from clients. So I'm gonna segue to that real quickly. Um, one question that's come in says, do you see prices in general going up once Americans can travel to Europe? If we're thinking about a trip, should we book now or wait and see how things go first? So um, I think that's a, a, a good question. And maybe um, who, who'd like to take that, that question first? Ori? Um, well, send it your way. No, a booking are always welcome. I mean, we need to <laughs> so. So book, 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 I mean, for sure. Um, and then we will see. Well, today I think every hotel is very 
flexible. And so it's yeah. much easier to eventually change the reservation, cancel it, rebooking it, to update the, the system with new uh, opportunity. Uh, but it's good as the same way as in dreaming about JK Malibu, someone needs to dream about uh, his uh, holidays this next summer. So it's definitely why not to book. Uh, actually, Capri uh, next season for June and July, all the guests, uh, mostly American, that uh, usually book their summer in Capri and they want the same room, the same date, they knew that 2020 was not unfortunately possible and they just rebook it for 2021 just to make sure that eventually next year they will have uh, their um, Capri vacation secured. Uh, so it's actually good and motivating, I think, for everyone to see people start to um, to do some uh, requests, reservation and booking and, and so on. Mm -hmm. And I think, and, and I know, Jennifer, you and I have talked about this on multiple occasions. Uh, we love working with partners such as yourself because we have great relationships with you. The, you have flexible booking policies. We know that there is um, uh, hesitancy, but also trepidation. And so we want to encourage clients to, to book if they know that they're interested in traveling in the future. But we also know that we can go to you and make changes should something happen down the road. So as things start to open up, there's going to be more and more pressure on hotels and they're better off trying to, you know, get that availability now while they can, um, as opposed to waiting while they might not have those dates available. Um, so I, there was another question that was kind of interesting um, that came, was to Jennifer. To Jennifer's comments, with restaurant capacities, is there any nervousness for those that are more conservative about COVID? Are these public places safe? Yes, we have the QR codes on the table, so you use your phone to click to get the menu so you don't have to touch a menu that another client has, has touched. Um, you know, when you go to the bathroom, you, you put your mask back on again. And, you know, when you're entering and exiting the restaurant, you have your mask on. But when you're sitting down, the, the waiters and everybody, everyone who's wearing their protective gear. And um, I feel very, very safe. It's very um, similar to here then. Yeah. It's interesting. It's, well. it's, it's interesting that uh, uh, a, a lot in, in, in all the Italian cities, or most Italian cities, um, the local authorities have allowed a much, much more outdoor space to be used. So the right. so restaurant had 10 tables outside. They now take up a whole square. So there no, yes. uh, uh, there's no tables uh, indoors anymore. People are sitting outside, where, of course, mm -hmm. there's much less danger of, uh, of contracting uh, any, any sort of disease. In fact. Yeah, it's true. Uh, it's very true. And I mean, I think, you know, we open, we open the Delusi, and uh, the bar and the garden there were immediately filled with Romans, you know, who were actually fed up with being locked in, uh, indoors. And you see, I mean, Pier Luigi, which is a famous restaurant in, in Rome, or a very popular rest fish restaurant in Rome, uh, there, there there's, a, there's a sort of little square where they're, they're situated. It's all covered with, with tables now. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of other examples of that across, across the various cities in and normally they're not really allowed to have that take those tables out in the piazza. But now, you know, Rome has actually increased the amount of space that you're allowed to have. Italy in general has increased the amount of space outdoors. Um, so yes, it's definitely true. And also we are in great weather right now, but we had a lot of rain this past week. Um, and I have to say on the first night, the second night as the lockdown ended on a Monday, that Tuesday night, we went out to a restaurant and we ate indoors. In May, and I have to say, it was still the best experience we had of all of the dining experiences we've had since. And it was it, they did an amazing job. So, I you know I have to say again, everybody has really stepped up. They're taking it seriously. I think nobody really wants to go back into a lockdown again. So we're all doing everything that we can to avoid that happening. So I, I think that this is an interesting question. It says, um, uh, 
it seems like Europe is somewhat getting back to normal. Do you think you'll welcome Americans with open arms or is there some hesitation based upon our medical history? I, I just want to say so, something. I feel so bad for the Americans. They feel like they're this like the evil stepchildren right now, but with the pariahs. <laughs> you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not. I mean, more than anything, we all want, you know, to come you all you all back for sure. I'm American too. You know, I, you know, we all, everybody here, I was in the South of France and somebody said, how did you get in? We miss this accent so much. You know, we really want Americans back. Really. It's, it's not that. I mean, we're, we're also going through it here with France and the UK and Spain and, you know, the, the second wave coming through. So, you know, we all have our restrictions against each other here, like you all do in the U S state to state. So, more than anything, we want the borders to open again, really. Um, all of us, I think the whole world wants the, op the borders to open for each, again, you know, for each other. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we're such a global community that, you know, if we could all do our part to make it happen, then we could all be there sooner, sooner rather than later. Yeah, anyway, I mean, the ab absolute numbers in the States are high because it's a huge population. If you look at it per million of population, it's not higher than anywhere else, actually. It's sort of in the middle, in the middle of, uh, of, uh, of, of cases uh, every, uh, in, in the world. No, of course we want them back. And how? <laughs> okay, <laughs> Start okay. them coming and keep them coming. complex going on over here. <laughs> um, so there's a question for Ori and Sirocco. It says, of all of your hotels, do you have a favorite property and why? I'm not allowed to have a favorite property. No, I know. Like, 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 favorite like my children. So <laughs> I don't, I, I, I like them all. They yeah. all have a different character. They're different attractions. Uh, and uh, the, the different psyche, actually. Uh, so, no, I like them all. I suppose, um, in a way, the hotel in Rome sort of put me on the map internationally, the Beru uh, Sea. And that, uh, the nice thing about that hotel was, was recreating a hotel which had been closed and turned into offices since before the war. So, so we brought back a hotel which had originally opened in 1837. Uh, and made it a uh, uh, you know perhaps actually the the uh, the number one hotel in in Rome. Although of course we have a lot of competitors, uh, but uh, 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 so you know that in a way I'm sort of almost most proud of that hotel than any other. And what about you? Um, what no, about uh, you? oh sorry yeah. No, of course, my answer is very similar to the one of uh, Sirocco. Um, <laughs> Florence was the first one, and that's where I started uh, in 2003. Uh, I was 26 when I opened this hotel, so of course, uh, I feel very attached to, to the first one. And then uh, Capri, which uh, uh, gave me this international um, opportunity to really welcome guests uh, uh, that I would never think I would ever really even be possible to welcome in any of my hotel and Rome, which was the first hotel in the capital city of Italy, and now Paris. Uh, it, 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 for me, it's an unbelievable uh, journey. So each hotel is really special. Uh, the, the most the most special one is the one in Malibu. That's still need to. <laughs> oh, well, well, that brings to the to the last question, and it's not really a question; it's more of a okay. comment. The last one says, "Can Ori please open JK?" <laughs> That yes, one. of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and then we can all meet there and without we'll meet masks there. Yes. and have a nice uh, aperitivo. So okay. I Done. want to thank all of you so much. This has meant the world to me. And uh, it's nice to see all your smiling faces. And I wish you the best in the coming months. I look forward to sending all our clients your way. And uh, have a great weekend. You too. Thank Thanks, you. Jolene. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Thank you. I think you did a very good job. I think we, and also, I think we behaved better than the two gentlemen last night. <laughs> I was going to say, you did. You were on your best behavior. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Thank ciao, you. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Bye.